Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terry Garcia, and I'm the Chief Science and Exploration Officer here at National Geographic. And this is our first panel. Uh, it's entitled Food Security in an Insecure World. Uh, and, you know, in a, a world that's buffeted by change, environmental, political, demographic, uh, the question is, how do we feed a growing population? And we have four experts here who are going to tell us how. Uh, so, starting at uh, the far end uh, from me is Dan Glickman, uh, who is co-chair of, uh, how do you pronounce this, is it Agri or Agri? Whatever makes you happier. Well, so, I say Agri. I agree. like the A, capital G, all right, Agri, which connects leaders around the world with food and agricultural issues. Uh, he's the executive director of the Aspen Institute Congressional Program, which seeks to educate Congress, which I think is a good thing. Um, members, uh, he was a member of Congress for 18 years, uh, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, uh, and chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America, so held some of the coolest jobs in Washington. <laughs> Uh, Jada McKenna, next to Dan, is Deputy Coordinator for Development uh, at the U.S. Feed the Future Initiative of USAID. Uh, she's also Acting Ad Assistant Administrator of USAID's Bureau for Food Security. Uh, she's held senior positions at the Gates Foundation, Monsanto, and the McKenzie and Company. Uh, Danielle Nirenberg uh, is co-founder and president of Food Tank. Uh, it's described as the food think tank for the seven billion who have to eat each day. Uh, she is an author and co-author of a number of books uh, that range from topics such as gender and population, factory farming in the developing world, and sustainable agriculture. Uh, she's traveled extensively in her job, uh, some 30 plus countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, and was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic. And then next to me is Jack Sinclair, who is the Executive Vice President of the Grocery Division at Walmart US. He has responsibility for Walmart's grocery merchandising at more than 4,000 stores throughout the United States. Uh, he's been in the retail food business since 1982, holding senior positions at Tesco and Safeway, among others. So um, let's start with an easy question first, a softball for you guys. Um, Jonathan says that uh, it's unlikely that we can double uh, food production. So what is it going to take to meet the nutritional needs of an additional 2 billion people in the next 40 years, given that we're not even coming close at this point? Uh, so. Maybe I'll, I'll start with Dan. Uh, first of all, thanks to National Geographic. Uh, can, can you imagine 20 or 30 years ago having this conversation? Uh, food and agriculture and diet, they finally made it to the level where energy and war and peace and other issues have been at the top. So that's really a terrific thing. And, but to answer your question, what's it going to take, in addition to the issues that John talked about and more funding for research, uh, basic research especially, but research on water, on sustainability, on drought, on nutrition. I mean, we, we've let our funding schemes for the research budget and, 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 and for agriculture and food fall rather d d dramatically. And that's, that's what's uh, built this industry and our ability to feed the world. But, but let me just say two things. One is I'm an old politician. So politics is such a foundational issue for everything that John and Dennis talked about. Politics in America, politics worldwide. I was just in Japan, and Japan has got a different system of agriculture that they're working their darndest to protect. And it's a very, very small-scale agriculture. You look at agriculture in the United States. You look at agriculture in Europe. And, and these issues dominate the way uh, policies are made. And so if we're going to really address this, these issues, then the political leaders have to be part of the game. And to date, they really haven't been very much part of the game. The second is governance in these countries. If we're going to make uh, real uh, strides, we've got to have systems of governance that allow people, uh, smallholder farmers, average people, consumers, have impact into the policies and, and also that democracies to the best extent possible can flourish so that the decisions are not made just because what the rich and powerful think or just only because what's in the best interest of the poor but for all the population as a whole. So politics, governance, and research. I've got more things to say but I think that that has as much to do with this as anything else. One final thing. There's an issue that hasn't been mentioned by anybody here and that's the issue of health. If you believe you are what you eat, 
and you watching the amount of non-communicable diseases dramatically rise all over the world, cardiovascular, diabetes, health-related diseases, in almost every context they're due to what you eat or what you don't eat. So the politics of food is also related very much to the politics of health. Yeah. Jada, do you want to... Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Dan, and, and I'd like to answer that question from a different dimension, and that is the dimension of the individual farmer. So in our work every day, we think about the 860 million people that go to bed hungry every night. Most of them are small farmers, uh, predominantly women, uh, who are working the land every day for their food. So what does that mean for them? They need the access to the research and the technologies that Dan, Dan mentioned. They need to be able to have um, the better crop varieties and the other tools to get as much out of their land as possible. Um, they need access to information about nutrition and other behavioral change things so that they can get more calories from what they're eating. Um, they need a lot of small scale solutions like local storage and things so that they don't waste the food that they have. Um, but they also need better safety nets and other things that help them to be more resilient and to plan and to be able to, to do more in, in lean times, whether that be crop insurance, which is a thing that most American farmers take for granted, or just even access to savings account and finance to buy food uh, when, when there is a lean season. Yeah. Danielle, did you care to? I would echo a lot of what Dan and Jada said, but I think we also need to start investing in the things that we already know work. You know, we've had this practice of agricultural abandonment for 30 or 40 years now where we completely ignored small-scale farmers, we ignored agriculture, and then, you know, the food crisis of 2007 and 2008 hit, you know, and that really hasn't gone away, and we're interested in agriculture again because we're scared. We see food riots, we see people really suffering and who, who have long been ignored. So investing in things like nutrient-dense crops and not the starchy staple crops that have gotten so much investment over the, the last uh, three or four decades, investing in the things that actually nourish people will go a long way in, in solving some of these problems. Things that, you know, uh, Jada uh, mentioned, you know, investing in women. Women make up 43% of the agricultural labor force and yet get very little uh, in terms of services. They don't have access to education or extension services. They don't have access to financial services or credit. And, and they, they don't get access to inputs in some of the services that male farmers do. And if, if we can give them those services and find ways to create that access, I, FAO predicts that we could lift 100 to 150 million people out of hunger and, and poverty. So those are some steps that need mm. to be taken. And Jack? Yeah, first of all, thanks to National Geographic for what they're doing here. I really think it's terrific. They've always, National Geographic to me when I was a little boy was always a window on the world. And I think putting a window on the world of this issue is a really important one. So I really appreciate the fact that we've all been pulled together here. When it comes to how, how we think about the challenge of, of sourcing the amount of food that Walmart, we, we, we sell more food than anybody else. Our big challenge is how do we source more of that food? And we think the challenge that we face of trying to buy a lot more food kind of mirrors the challenge of how do we create more food for the world. And it really is, I thought, some of the, the, the discussion that we had just a moment ago, some of the things that you've all talked about, how do we create more food more efficiently? As we look at the challenge of buying a billion pounds more bananas between now and 2018, how, how are we going to use water more effectively? How are we going to use the... the resources of the planet more effectively to produce that. We fundamentally believe technology plays a huge role in that. The role of technology at trying to make food more efficient and more efficiently produced. We think fundamentally there's opportunities to use areas of the world where there is fertile land available to produce. We think in the United States about the Mississippi River Delta, the opportunity to produce more food in that environment. <coughs> and there's opportunities within the local farming to within the local farming movement, which we're very supportive of, how to create more crops closer to where we sell the, the, the food that we, we want to produce. And the other point that I think is really important is the food waste point. Food waste is such a kind of, it's so morally bankrupt, the amount of food waste that happens in the, in the world. 
And part of the issues are small issues about what happens in consumers' homes. There's some packaging opportunities in that. There's ways of, 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 of we as a consumer company making some improvement there. There's challenges in terms of the supply chain. How do products travel such a long way and the waste that's involved in that traveling? There's ways of doing that more efficiently going forward, and we're thinking about that. And then there's some pretty big things. I had the, I had the opportunity to be in Peru last, last week, which is a, a fascinating country, a real natural greenhouse where mm. the, the cooling air of the Antarctic make the, a very warm country appropriate for a lot of agriculture growth. But irrigation schemes that allow the deserts to turn into blueberry fields and asparagus fields, astonishing to watch. But you need roads, you need airports, you need ports to enable some of that product to get to the, to get to the consumer so that we're getting less waste. If you looked at the chart there, India is an amazingly fertile country. It's astonishing the amount of food that's produced in India and then wasted because it just can't get to market because the infrastructures aren't there, which Dan links a lot to the politics of how do we create the politics to create the infrastructure. And I think USAID and some of the work you guys are doing to try and make that come alive is going to be important going forward. Yeah. Good, good. Now, you've raised a number of issues. Let's, um, maybe we can stick with how do you source more food? And I'd like to get your comments on this, this growing phenomenon that we're seeing of rich countries uh, buying or, or it's been called renting food from poor ones uh, to increase their own food supply. Uh, and uh, how big an issue is that or problem? And if it is, what do we do about it? And I think I'll start with Jada. If done correctly, it's an opportunity. Uh, if it provides a, a market for, for, for food from these countries and allows more income for the people that are benefiting from that trade to then uh, be able to buy other food locally, that, that's appropriate. Um, where it's irresponsible is where people think of the, the land grabs and that, and, and, and that is something that um, there's a lot more transparency needed in terms of what's happening, uh, where land is going, more responsible land tenure systems, and there are other safeguards that we need to put in place to prevent that from happening. You know, yeah. if, you were, if you were from China and you're looking down the road and you have 1.3 billion people and you want to keep those people happy and uh, not marching in Beijing, the Great Hall of the People, then you're going to kind of figure out how you're going to feed these people in the future. Well, you're going to buy a lot from like the United States and elsewhere, which they do, but you're also going to try to source that as much as you possibly can. And so they're out in Latin America and East Africa and other places buying a lot of land. And it's a problem, I have to tell you. It's because often with those purchases do not go good farming practices, good sustainability practices, and democracy building activities. Mm -hmm. So it's got to really be watched carefully. And for folks like the UN, university people, we need to make sure we have the data on this so people see it happening. But on the other hand, the fact of the matter is we're telling people to eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, I wish we could grow them all in the United States, but unless, until global warming really hits us, we're not going to be able to grow as, uh, <coughs> as much blueberries and tangerines and citrus and avocados and other things in the United States. So we're going to have to buy those elsewhere. And there's a great opportunity, I think, as long as we're fair in our trade practices and as long as we try to build up working conditions in places where we buy, because we buy coffee almost everywhere in the world, and a lot of the companies are, in fact, doing a better job of making sure that people are treated well there, is we've got to make sure as we buy these that we encourage sustainable practices in the process. And if we do that, then we can build up those countries and not tear them down. Well, this is uh, an opportunity for groups like the Rainforest Alliance, who works very closely with smallholder farmers all over the world, to put those practices in place so that both the farmers are, are getting a fair price for what they're growing and we as eaters can feel good about it so that we don't because there's not this transparency in the food system that we would all like you know these these sorts of fair trade uh, standard and, and certification programs are very important and, and the rainforest alliance really does this better than anyone yeah. Jack, so I, I certainly think transparency is going to help all of us I think the the, the the inevitability is we are we have to source food from all over the world. You go no matter how good your local program is, we have to buy bananas from Costa Rica. It, it's just the way it is, and that's because and people want to buy that. We'll always be standing for giving people choice to buy anything that they want to buy and finding our way of creating availability for customers. Within that context, 
we have to try and do it as efficiently as we can. And efficiency often comes from sharing best practice. It's really interesting when you look at things like the use of uh, fertilizer. Mm. If we could use less fertilizer, I think the world will be in a better place for carbon emissions and the, the, the impact on, on climate. But it's quite interesting in certain parts of the world it's being used very efficiently and other parts of the world not being used efficiently. How can, I think there's opportunities for us to learn in terms of what's happening in one place and applying it in other places, which actually will, I think, strengthen food security going forward and actually hopefully bring price of food down. One of the challenges that we, we always think about is as we try and get to food security, what is the impact mm -hmm. on the price for the customer? Because the biggest <coughs> threat to food security is if the price of commodity price of foods go up and people literally get dragged into hunger. So the, for, the, the forces that try and bring the price of food down to drive efficiency is a very important force to ensure that we get the security of the food that we need. Can I just mention one? Yeah, How U.S. farm policy, let's bring a little bit down to earth. For years and years, if you were a U.S. farmer and you wanted a subsidy from the government and you planted one of the major crops, wheat, corn, cotton, rice, and soybeans, you were given a crop base. You could grow on that, but you couldn't grow anything else on that. So if you wanted to grow peaches or pears or tomatoes on your wheat base, now this is modern America, this isn't 19th century uh, or 20th century Russia, this is America. You couldn't plant those crops or else you'd lose all your payments on your base of wheat, corn, cotton, rice, and soybeans. So what did that mean? That meant that vast areas of the country that could be planted to alternative crops in addition to the base crops couldn't because a farmer couldn't do it. Uh, this farm bill changed that a little bit. It also allowed for the first time to buy risk management and crop insurance mm -hmm. on new crops. So, I mean, it's just kind of a simple thing that, you know, you try to want to bring as much flexibility into the American, I'm just talking about American farm world. The European farm world is even far more complicated and rigid than the American farm world. But just a thing that maybe that will help us realize we can grow a lot of things in this country that we haven't been growing. And I think that our... As the price of energy continues to rise, there's more opportunities to have more local production. It's really interesting in, in Arkansas, which used to be... I'm from Arkansas, you can tell from my accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the Arkansas used to grow a lot of the nation's apples. And because the soil in Washington's better and it's easier to grow up with the amount of rain, it, it, apples started to be produced in huge volume. And, and a lot of second, third generation Arkansans are out in Washington growing apples. Mm -hmm. As the price of energy changes it, bringing it across the country, as that changes and that drives it, I think that's going to be one of the economic drivers to get more local production of crops that are perfectly, perfectly high quality and can be done the right way closer to home. Yeah. Can I just add yeah, something ahead. on that? You know, I think the, the drought that hit the Midwest in, the 2012, in 2012 and the drought that's occurring in California right now is making farmers and eaters sort of rethink production, you know, because the, the crops that they could grow, you know, 10 or 15 years ago aren't going, they might not be able to grow them 10 or 15 years from now. And this is a, a real opportunity for us to learn what you know, from small farmers in the developing world who have been adapting to variations in weather and climate change for, for a while now. They've, they've been able to change their practices and we have a lot to learn from them. It's, it's not always the other way around where we have, you know, we can teach them something. They, we can also learn from them. Okay. So uh, Jonathan mentioned in his um, uh, opening remarks that, that we also have to change behavior, you know, how and, and what we eat. Uh, and at the beginning of this panel, we talked about the fact that we have a growing population. Two billion more people are going to be added, but we're also seeing this other phenomenon of massive urbanization uh, around the world, uh, where in many cases you're going to have a richer uh, population demanding more food. How is that going to impact this, this dialogue that we're having now, this issue? We're looking at the opportunities that that creates. So for one of the things that we're trying to do is keep rural environments healthy and strong and to provide good livelihoods uh, for rural producers in the developing world. So those urban markets become a source of, that. those are markets for those farmers. So we're looking for transport solutions and storage solutions to get to them. I mean, the other piece of that behavior changes, as, as we know, and as Jonathan talked about, as consumers get more income, their diets change, or they begin to think things that they might have had back in the village and the field, like the indigenous vegetables 
vegetables that were grown there all of a sudden aren't good enough. Well, they're great enough. <laughs> they're much healthier than some of the other things that they might replace those things with. So I think there is this, there's this continuing education and behavior change dynamic, especially for the urban populations mm -hmm. that go further away, but also as the rural economies grow, um, convincing those rural the, the, some of the foods that you were eating before, like, like sorghum or these leafy green indigenous vegetables, are still great foods that you should continue to eat and, and, and that we should continue to be marketing in urban environments. You know, you know uh, I've got this. Everybody, I'm sure everybody in this room has one of these things. I just came back from Guatemala and Honduras on a care-sponsored trip. I saw more cell towers in Guatemala than I've seen in the United States. They're everywhere. The, the, the ability to access the internet was better outside of Guatemala City than any place in Washington, D.C. that I was at. Okay, <laughs> so what does that mean? I mean, that has a powerful factor in terms of information, ability to communicate, understanding what's happening, and giving consumers more power everywhere, even poor consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, the democratization of the food movement is, I think, very consistent with new technologies, and it will allow a lot more ability for the consumers to demand things that they want. And I think that's a big factor in this whole area, that it's, it, somebody said, I think John said, it's not all bleak. Well, part of it's not bleak because people have the ability to access information everywhere. But it does present a problem because if the world is rapidly urbanizing and if 70% of the water is going to feed crops, how do you think the people in urban areas are going to react when they can't get water? Uh, what do you think the Chinese government's going to do to try to quell, let's say, disturbances on the ground when people can't get water? And so I, I do think that as we talk about this issue of urbanization, and we are going to see more farmers markets, more growing of crops locally. Somebody said that we're going to be growing more crops on building roofs and all that things. It's possible. I hope so. But it does present an enormous potential conflict of water rights and the ability of consumers in cities to have water and the ability of farmers to grow crops and raise animals to have water. That is an enormous challenge. With regard to urbanization, I think one of the things that's quite... Access to food is not that good in the urban markets of the United States. It's not that far, not far from where we're sitting here to now, here just now. There's not great access to high quality fresh foods. If you go to Chicago and Los Angeles and New York, it's not easy to access well-priced, affordable fresh foods. And that's certainly, you know, and certainly the, the, that's an important part of some of the things we're trying to do at Walmart and building some stores in, in urban areas. We've got two pretty close to here that have opened in the last year. And part of that is how do we bring access? We've been very encouraged by the, the Let's Move program that Michelle Obama d d d worked on. And we've been trying to support that in a, in, a, in a very proactive way. Some of the things about changing people's diets, you can only do so much. People have to choose. But the one thing we can do is make sure price is not a determining factor in people choosing unhealthy diets over healthy diets. So simple things like high sodium soups against low sodium soups, why can we not at least have them at the same price? It tends to be that the low sodium versions or the, 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 the lower sugar versions or the lower fat versions tend to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. Than the stand, and we're doing a lot of work to try and equalize so that the choice that people make is based on the choice that they want to make from their diet's point of view, not based on price. And too often, there's not enough access to healthy foods, fresh foods at the right prices. And that's something that I think we can make a difference on. And, and just to go back to both Dan and Jada's point about different kinds of foods and, and water. I, again, for me, it really gets back to this investment that needs to happen in, in, in different kinds of crops and nutrient-dense crops and crops that can preserve water resources, that it can enhance soils. And, you know, it, it takes some education and awareness about these indigenous foods that people have looked down upon because they consider them poor people's foods or weeds. And, you know, it's very interesting when you walk into, you know, a market or a, a small grocery store in um, Dakar, a, a Bidijan, you'll, you'll see very few few products actually produced, you know, from Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire in, in, in those markets, in those grocery stores. So really sort of um, having a, a, a program to really help people value the foods that they grew up on, the foods that are regional and local, that are culturally appropriate, and, and again, nutrient-dense and diverse, that can really help, mm -hmm. I think, a lot in urban areas. 
Okay. Uh, so let, let's move to a non-controversial topic. Uh, what, and I'd like to hear from each of you, what, what's the role of, of genetically modified uh, plants? <laughs> <clears throat> And, and should we be seeking to improve genetic features and characteristics of crops? When's Who wants to start? question coming? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? Yeah. yeah. Um, technology's got a key role to play in terms of driving efficiency and driving a, a, the economics of producing food more effectively and more, more uh, to enable us to produce more food with less resources. We had a really interesting conversation with a, a farmer from Illinois this week who was down at we, we convened a group of people together at, at, uh, in Bentonville and got a lot of CEOs from Monsanto and PepsiCo and made some commitments, very specific commitments in the, in the agriculture space and how we can reduce greenhouse gases and a number of things. And um, the conversation we had with the, with the farmer, a second, third generation uh, farmer from Illinois, family farm, showed his picture of all his, of all his children and his grandchildren. And what he talked about was and he, he very specifically made the plea, please don't, please don't tell me I can't use genetically modified crops, Walmart, uh, genetic, genetically modified materials, Walmart, because my son and my grandsons are able to produce food without spraying mm. insecticides, which I had to do. And I want to be able to spray, I want them to be able to not have to use insecticides. So the benefits of GM, there are real benefits of GM, it's not the panacea to any of the challenges of producing food in the world. And I, th I think some of the initiatives in smallholders and making sure we go back to some of the principles that worked really effectively in agriculture over many centuries are really important as well. And it can't be a very simple solution that says GMs are all the answer and GMs not mm. the answer. It's an incredibly polarizing issue. But I think there's a middle ground that makes sense in terms of maximizing the production of food that we can get from scarce resources, making the environment a better place going forward while using them effectively, while not abandoning all the other sensible and creative ways yeah. that we can make food more efficient. So, so before I leave you, could, could you just comment on how Walmart is addressing this in, in terms of, of educating the public for or against uh, on, the, on this issue? Well, it, it's, it's, we don't see it as our role to educate yeah. the public. We, we, will, we will stand for choice. We'll put products in front of people and give them the choice. And we're expanding our organic. We think the best way for customers to access non-GMO products, which, which a lot of them want to do, is for us to provide a much broader organic assortment. We've made an announcement in the last two or three weeks where we're going to launch a, a brand called Wild Oats, where the pricing of organic is going to be the same pricing as conventional, so people can access organic food. And that's, the, I think, the best way for a customer that's got a very clear view that they don't want GM in their food to enable them to access that comfortably without having to pay a premium for it. Yeah. Anybody else? On? Sure. Uh, you know, there's no question that, that agricultural biotechnology is very interesting and sexy, and it, it creates obviously a lot of controversy. F for me, who's someone who has ad had this incredible opportunity to talk to hundreds of farmers and farmers groups all over the world, for me, what it comes down to is, is biotechnology and agriculture living up to its promises. And, and in some cases, I think it's not. Uh, conventional uh, yields versus organic yields versus biotech yields are, are pretty much the same, and often organic comes out ahead. And, and, and in, you know, again, because of my experience, you know, my question is always, is this helping improve the lives of small farmers? Are they getting greater income? Are they eating more diverse foods? Are they able to you know, really just improve their overall livelihoods? Um, and, and for me, I haven't seen that. I, I think there may be potential there. But again, it really comes down to investing in what we already know works. The things that are sort of the low-hanging fruit in, in the food system, the, the, the things that John Foley talked about a little while ago. Food waste is the low-hanging fruit. We're, we're wasting uh, or losing, you know, uh, at least 30% of all the food that is produced. But there are very simple measures that farmers can take to prevent food loss from, from field, you know, to, to market, to fork. Um, very low cost and expensive things that can be done from better drying techniques to better cooling and storage systems to very simple things like roads. And so if we're going to invest in something, I think it should be those things and, and instead of just you know, looking at, 
And again, I think it's a very interesting and it could be a potential solution, but we have to make the, these changes now. We have to feed people now and we have to really find ways to do that better. The U.S. has is, is home to some of the largest areas of organic production in the world, as well as some of the largest areas of, of GMO and conventional production in the world. And, and, what that's, and that's because of choice. Farmer, small holder, far, farmers have to be able to make the choice of what's good for their climate, for their soils, what kind of farming is best for them. And consumers are making choices about what kind of food they want to eat. Uh, genetically, genetic engineering um, has a lot of, can provide, is a, a important tool and can do things to enhance the nutrient of crops, it can also enhance the production of crops. And so it's an important tool in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. It's not a magic bullet, but it's certainly one that people deserve to have access to the choice <coughs> and, and to have a full array of tools in front of them to decide what's the best solution for their farming system, if they're farmers and if they're consumers, what's the best solution for, for what I want to eat. Well, I'm a little bit like Jack. I'm kind of in the middle of the road on this. I recall there was an ag commissioner in Texas named Jim Hightower, and he said the only thing in the middle of the road is a yellow stripe and a dead armadillo. <laughs> okay, so, and, and probably Jack and I, you know. I, I have complained to some of the seed companies that the traits that they've produced don't seem to benefit consumers. I've said if you maybe make some traits that would grow hair in addition to resisting insects, maybe Jack and I would even yeah, be more advocating of that. But here, here's the deal. Okay. Okay, so I was down in I, uh, Guatemala and Honduras visiting smallholder farmers. I mean, what, what they need is uh, some fertilizer. They need better seeds. Uh, they don't necessarily need GMO crops right now. Yeah. They can double and triple their yields by just using more modern farming techniques, which uh, AID is helping them on, which extend, they're building extension systems. And so to large parts of the world, these are not necessarily issues that relate to them, as Danielle said. On the other hand, um, we, you know, there's an, there's an ideology out there about this. It's like you're either for or against GMOs, kind of a, on your, are you on the left or are you on the right? The fact of the matter is, is that it's why we need a supple research budget to look at all these things to examine the options. Now, if we're facing climate change and global warming, which I think we are, we're going to see a lot more plant disease. We're going to see a lot less water. And we've got to, can't just reject the options that are out there to grow more food with less water and uh, have plants that are more, uh, less susceptible to stress and disease. We've got, because of lack of a lot of genetic diversity, we've got some crops out there like wheat that are very susceptible to a worldwide plant epidemic of disease. So you're going to need some technologies, new technologies, and just to say no GMOs is just to close the door on science, which is a terrible thing for us to do for the population of this world that's going to need to eat uh, reliably in a, in a vastly changing world with vastly changing climate. Yeah. Let's, uh, maybe we can stay with climate because you, you've mentioned one thing that we could do perhaps in response to a changing climate. Uh, the, the most recent report that's come out of the IPCC is not the most encouraging. Uh, it indicates that greenhouse gases are increasing faster than we thought and that it is possible that we could exceed that two degrees centigrade uh, ceiling that we hoped we would never uh, pass through. Uh, what else can we do as we begin to approach this this uncertain uh, we've future? We've got to change the politics of this. Uh, in fact, I'm involved with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We're going to have a symposium in, this, in Washington in two weeks to talk about climate change and weather variability. But in this country, the politics divide the country almost in half, whether you believe climate change is real or whether you believe it's not real. And in the process, we're gridlocked on these issues, uh, on issues of, for example, how we deal with carbon emissions. and. And I think most farmers out in the countryside know that something's happening. Weather is changing. Uh, it's getting warmer and drier, and the weather is more volatile than it used to be. Now, whether this is because of the natural evolution of, of weather and climate, or whether it's because of uh, more uh, carbon emission in the atmosphere, whether it's man-made caused or whether it's natural, it's happening. So we have to deal with it. And, and what's happening is, is that the United States, I think, has been stuck 
on these issues because of the politics and the ideology of climate change. And therefore, we haven't been as participatory in the rest of the world it, 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 as it's been looking at these things. At the same time, I think there are a lot of folks in the U.S. feel that maybe some other folks look at this from an ideological perspective and not from good science perspective. But, and, and I, you know, I understand that. But I would hope that maybe one of the things that come, come out of this conference and out of the series that National Geographic is going to do is, is a kind of description of the problems of weather and climate in a way where the American people can understand it better, becomes less political, less ideological, and uh, a little more objective in terms of discussion. Uh, back to you again, Dan. The, the role of research, I actually had a question on that. You raised it. You've raised it several times now. Uh, what do we do about that? How, how do we find the resources that are necessary uh, to have a robust research and scientific program. I have thought that if we put all agriculture research within the Department of Defense, we would get plenty of money <laughs> to fund these things, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, or the National Institutes of Health, you know. Uh, you know, ultimately, you've got to get political support for this. We have, you know, good research institutions, but the level of research in agriculture and food and real dollars has been going down. The companies, a lot of the big companies do a lot of their own research, but that does, as Jack and I were talking about before, that doesn't deal with some of the basic issues, uh, plant genetics, understanding growth patterns that uh, we need to do. So it just needs to be a higher priority within the agriculture world and the food world. Uh, and one final thing, in the last farm bill, when we had, it took three years to get this farm bill passed, there was virtually no discussion of research. None. The discussion was almost always on what was going to be the payments to farmers under the existing uh, programs. And uh, so if, as we talk about these issues today, in the United States, we need to kind of, and I've been a big advocate of farm programs over the years, and I'm from Kansas, and we uh, have been a beneficiary of a lot of those programs. But, but in agriculture itself, we have to look at these issues much broader and much more holistically than just how much each farmer is going to get in payments from Uncle Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Under Feed the Future, we have uh, the United States government has increased its its investment in research, uh, in agricultural research uh, for the countries in which we serve dramatically, um, and a lot of that, uh, a lot of how we're trying to get more out of our investment dollars is through collaboration. So we work very intensively with the U.S. Uh, university community. Um, we have a series of, we have 23 innovation labs that seek to, to leverage U.S. innovation and expertise. Also in partnerships with private companies, so uh, DuPont or Monsanto may be developing drought tolerant varieties for rich farmers. We as governments can work with them to also adapt those technologies for poorer farmers. Uh, we also are investing a tremendous amount in working with local countries to invest their own local agricultural research institutes because we need, in developing countries, we need those research institutes to be doing cutting-edge science on, on the crops and on the pests and the different things that affect their agriculture. So it is really an integral part of our program and something where really connecting scientists as well as increasing the investment we think will have huge dividends. Okay. Uh, yeah, Daniel. Sure. It's not only connecting scientists, which is so important, but connecting scientists to farmers on the ground who are actually doing the, the work. And that's why participatory mm -hmm. research is so important. Um, you know, and engaging those farmers and, and, you know, helping us understand what they need rather than telling them what yes. they want in so many Agreed. cases. I also think it's important on the research side to recognize, um, you know, some, some groups that may not be traditional scientific research institutes or universities. You know, the Rodale Institute, who I think is here somewhere in the audience today, has been doing these 30-year studies of how to uh, really not just, you know, adapt to climate change and mitigate climate change, but also, you know, really turn back climate change through some of their work on soil. So I think that's important to understand. And I'm sure Jerry Glover, who's on the next panel, will talk about the important work that the Land Institute has been doing for many years. So it's it's important to really you know for lack of a better phrase to think outside the box when we're talking about research it's not you know just always scientists and labs it's it's a lot of the work that needs to be done in fields and kitchens all over all over the world yeah. so from from our point of view we've got a program called the future of food which is a we didn't copy National Geographic, but we, we're looking at where we're going to be five years from now in terms of what we need to source globally. And it always comes back to how are we going to use our, 
our resources more effectively. So if you go to a country like Israel and see how they are developing their technologies to utilize water more effectively, it's, it's astonishing to see the kind of drip irrigation in, in, innovation that's coming in terms of a root that's one centimetre from the other gets more water than the other depending on what it needs from its nutrients and providing capital solutions with that kind of research. So in order to fulfil our needs going forward, we're signing a number of research agreements. We've done it with two institutes in Israel. We're doing some work in, in Holland. How do you create the technology to make it more efficient for us to produce more food? cheaper. I don't pretend to understand how the politics of this will all play out, but ultimately we, we, we think that research plays the fundamental role and the research I'm talking about is one step removed from the research that I think needs to go on to really truly get US agriculture where it needs to be going forward because it's always been, if you think about somebody like Norlin, Norman Borlaug, one of the great Americans who transformed agriculture from what he did, we need that kind of field work that went on behind that and the combination of the science and technology that goes to make that work more effectively and anything we can do to encourage that and anything all of you can do to encourage that i think will make a significant difference to the u.s and to the capacity for the planet to feed its population great okay uh now for the uh hard part of the day we're going to take questions from the audience we've uh, I've been trying to warm them up and uh, give them time to think about what they want to ask we have time for a few questions uh, and somebody has a microphone that they'll be bringing around. I see uh, someone right down here. Thank you, David Lambert. Great panel. Uh, I get the sense from what I've read recently and what I've heard today that the political alliances on climate change are about to change really dramatically. Um, when Walmart has trouble sourcing food and Nike can't source cotton and Coca-Cola can't source water and citrus. Uh, is industry, are companies beginning to think we may be on the wrong side of this fight? And will that help raise awareness in Congress about climate change? Well, I, my judgment is if you ask me what the most, who is the most important force <coughs> in the world today on agriculture, I'd point to Walmart, not the United States government, not the United Nations, and Walmart and others, not just you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No because, pressure, Jack. Yeah, right. <laughs> because their ability to listen to their consumers and then to source product based upon what they think is in their interest, which is, is becoming more sustainability, better working conditions, better water, better treatment of growers, and climate. Um, they can have this powerful impact, they and others like them, and I think it's happening now. And the U.S. government and others may be following behind, not leading in this regard. Yeah. I think it's important that the corporations, I think the thing I said to you earlier, we, we convene, Walmart's got the power of convening. We don't do anything else but buy things and sell things, but we've got a power of convening. And the opportunity that we had this week in Bentonville with Coca-Cola and Monsanto and Cargill and the Dairy Farmers of America and a number of other people to say, what are the key issues? And agricultural inputs are one of the key issues facing all of us. The scarcity of that and the impact that using it in a, in, with overindulgence, the impact that's having on climate change, and then the impact that's having the opportunity. And we've made a number; we've all made a number of commitments behind that. I think they all play a key role within it. But I do think the government's got a big role to play in terms of how you can support the whole <coughs> industry. And that's back to this research and the science and supporting science. I don't. Again, I don't pretend to understand the politics of it, and I think it is too polarizing. But it seems to me that primary research has got a really key role to help organizations like Coca-Cola and PepsiCo and Walmart be more effective at what we do as well. So do we have time for another couple of questions? Yeah, yeah? OK. Um, anyone else? Oh, there's somebody with a hand up right there. Hi, thank you for this wonderful forum. My name is Helen Dambalas. I am with the National Farm to School Network. And um, we're talking a lot about the future of food, and part of the future is our children. So farm to school is not just about getting local farm fresh products into schools, which you know, reduces food miles, gives farmers a bigger share of the dollar, supports community economic development, but it's also about school gardens and educational curriculum. 
So it's not trying to teach every kid to want to be a farmer. Granted, we do have an aging population of farmers in this country, almost 58 years old. So we do need some kids to want to be farmers, but it's knowing that the future generation are our, our, our future eaters, our future researchers. So I'm curious if any of you are looking at that, that younger generation and, and considering the importance of educating um, children in the work that all of you do, or it, perhaps if that's part of what National Geographic is looking at. Thank you. Anybody care to? Uh, absolutely. It's a really important uh, part of Food Tank's work. We want to cultivate the next generation of agricultural leaders. And as you said, that's not just farmers. It's well-informed eaters. It's uh, food scientists and researchers, which, you know, especially uh, women and girls, we want to encourage them to, to partake more in that, that sort of uh, work. We want to uh, help entrepreneurs in the food system really get the, the resources and the tools they need to be good at food businesses, small and large. And so I, I think without that, as you said, you know, the, the average age of farmers, according to the latest ag census, is 58.3 years old in the United States. It's gone up since the last one. In, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's roughly 57 years old. So we have this aging population of, of people who are providing food for all of us. And so how do we, you know, how do we uh, capitalize on, on programs like yours where you're teaching kids to appreciate food, you're teaching them how to grow it, you're probably teaching them how to cook it, you're teaching them how to share it. These are all important things for really the future of food for us all. And I'd say 4-H does an amazing job and now more and more in urban areas, get your local school districts all over the country to really get involved in this. I think the transparency of food and making making us all passionate about how food's grown and how food's produced and it's inspiring children can inspire all of us in terms of their real passion for that when they get involved in it and I think there's a lot more we can all do and I think the food industry needs to become much more transparent about how it does things and what it does things and be very comfortable with letting people in our farms and letting people on our farm in our, in our see how things are growing see how animals are raised and and there's some there's some real opportunities, I think, for all of us to get behind that. This is a question from Twitter user Modern Farmer. Uh, he asks, how do we make sure that relevant technologies reach rural farmers for increased in quality production? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, that's historically been a big, in the US, it's been a big role of extension. Uh, uh, through the land-grant college movement to get education on modern techniques in agriculture, food production, and nutrition to farmers and to local folks, more uh, urban and rural. And I know that AID is yes. very actively involved in this whole concept of extension and using this model, this amazing model that was developed during the administration of Abraham Lincoln that changed America profoundly. And some of those same techniques are just applicable all over the world. Yeah, exactly so. And, and we're looking at a variety of extensions. So there's there's a lot of private company extension. There's still government extension agencies that we need to beef up, as well as like using your people's cell phones as extension tools, radio as extension tool, lots of ways uh, to promote and, and disseminate technologies. More, uh, a corollary to that that's actually also very important is making sure there's equitable access to those technologies so that those technologies are available to women in those rural communities, that the women's use of those technologies is thought of when those technologies are designed. So uh, we, we promote them and we think about ways to disseminate them, but also making sure that they are available to women and that and accessible to women is a big part of, of adoption and, and really getting it out there. Yeah, okay. I, I'm afraid that's going to be the last word. Uh, I want to thank this panel. You guys did a great job. Uh, please give them a hand.